and welcome to Scary to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. As you probably noticed already, we have quite a supersized episode this week. This story by Vid Butcher really struck me because it reminds me of an amalgamation of Mark Z. Danielewski's House of Leaves and all of H.B. Lovecraft's work. So if that sounds like something that would be up your alley, then you're in for a treat. Also this week, we are sponsored by Green Chef. Check out the show notes to find out how to get $50 off your first box. Now, on to the story. Enjoy the Mauve Room. The phenomenon began in North America, then succeeded in parts of Central and South America. Before its mark on Western Europe, it was reported by several people in Kazakhstan, perhaps in other parts of Eurasia, but visions people had of the place couldn't be substantiated in other parts of the steppe. The international phenomenon was the recurring vision each person had of a foyer. My dissertation was in its final draft when my mentor, Dr. Miles Phelps, also my partial employer, implored me to stop everything and come to his office for his next patient visit and to record in robust detail his patient's hallucinations. As per the requirements of my doctoral fellowship, I had to sit in on 200 hours with Dr. Phelps, and it had been a painstaking demand to meet. So I was a bit flustered and frustrated at having to sit on yet another patient and take the doctor's notes. I had only recently completed that chapter of my journey, but still being a PhD candidate, I had no choice. His text message was brief. Can you sit in on a case today? 4.30? Question mark. I was a tad perplexed at the text, and as I was considering how to respond, he called me. His voice was rushed, more so than usual. She saw the hallucination in the foyer. It's a patient you've sat in on before, he said excitedly, hurriedly. That was the first time I heard about the foyer phenomenon. I asked him what he was talking about, of course, and of course he said he could tell me later. He just wanted to know if I could sit in with him. So naturally I obliged. What was so perplexing to me was that Dr. Phelps and I had certainly had our disagreements. Dr. Phelps wouldn't hesitate to write multiple prescriptions and in high doses. He had called me a pseudo-shrink and hippie many times. Of course, I am in full support of prescription meds, but my dissertation, my Hippocratic mission, is to help heal patients and to strive for full recovery if possible. My dissertation, more pointedly, is an examination of the nearly 70% of Americans on prescription drugs. Essentially, we are, have been, and seems we will forever be, a nation of pill poppers, concerned more with circumventing our problems rather than dealing with and prognosing them. Lana was her name. She sat in Dr. Phelps's squeaky leather love seat, nervously anticipating the meat of why she was truly there. She'd had such a vivid, inexplicably unnerving, and scary description about a non-existent place. I could understand why Phelps' over-docile tapping at his laptop and asking the mechanical warm-up questions would be so aggravating. The question had begun to wreak louder and stronger tremors throughout the world of psychology. How could a hallucination be shared with so many people, all totally unrelated, at different places and times? What was the link? Several televangelists had begun the latest cottage industry of scaremongering, rural yeomen and the low-income earners in the geriatrics. The internet blazed with prophetic blog posts, end times extraterrestrials who'd be arriving at any day, revealing doom or fortune or some undecipherable mix. Of course, I never experienced this grand hallucination, 
but I can confidently say that the research I've put together since hearing Lana's description is quite detailed and could perhaps help in the quest for answers. I've read and heard many such explanations that it's an evolutionary adaptation coming into play, that the foyer is actually a parlor to some grand church or religious site, and even though the people experiencing the visions might not be consciously aware of having seen the place in books or media, some innate caveat or coded message is developing. I'd read from one terribly credible psychologist who hypothesized that the visions, if they were indeed visions, were sparked by vaporous or otherwise unconsciously transmitted drugs, perhaps testing the integrity of some idea-implanting effect. There are many theories which overlap, but I'd never been convinced of the foyer not being a real place after all. The following details my observations of the 13 people I've interviewed. Three Americans, including Lana, two Britons, one Irish woman, one German, two Hondurans, and four Kazakhs. The foyer has a mauve carpet. Where the carpet meets the wall, floor runners are a solid gray trim, and there are four ornately ornamented armchairs, two on either side of the room. The floral pattern on the chairs resemble that of irises and roses, with thorns protruding from the stems. The color scheme of the chairs are blunted, so as to match with the mauve carpet. The walls are white. The German man I interviewed, Helmut, also mentioned seeing chrysanthemums of a light pink color. None of the other twelve recalled this, but they all emphatically stated that the chair legs were taloned. From the descriptions of the dark wood and glossy lacquer, I can only assume that the legs are of an oak or cherry. The ceiling is 13 to 18 feet tall. I've determined using exhaustive spatial perception questioning on each interviewee. The room is cordoned off by a double set of gray doors in front and behind, or north and south. And at the right and left east and west of the room, Closest to the north door, the mauve carpet, gray floor runners, and white walls appear to form hallways on either side. On my first round of interviews, none had ventured far down the hall, and it is apparently unlit and blackness envelops it after only eight to a dozen feet. I later read that there were other victims who'd ventured down the hall on either side of these northern double doors. Each reported a sense of nightmarish personal items flare up. There is no uniformity of vision beyond these halls, so I omitted such speculation at first. All 13 of my interviewees mentioned being severely frightened at the thought of walking the opaque halls. Of the eight who agreed to be hooked into polygraphs, their adrenaline and pulse rates heightened drastically when asked about what they personally thought the halls were, or to where they might lead. Lighting the foyer is a hanging chandelier with electric bulbs. On the exact number of electric candles, no one can be sure, but there is a unanimous agreement that the chandelier has two tiers. My personal calculation places the exact number of lighted electric candles at about two dozen. Finally, on either side of the walls between both sets of armchairs are matching mirrors. They face each other and appear to be placed exactly in the center of its wall, thus creating the infinite mirror tunnel. It is in this mirror tunnel that the most curious and disturbing variances occur. Bakit, the 28-year-old Kazakh, was nearly hit by a motorcyclist, when he found himself standing directly in the center of the mirror tunnel and seeing small creatures who would have come up no higher than my waist and being, in his description, hair-laden things that sound a lot like Cousin It from the Adams family. He was on the street in downtown Almaty when he became enraptured with the hallucination, and walking into the center of the foyer between the mirrors brought him into the middle of the road. Askar, 52, was apparently lost for an indecipherable amount of time in the foyer, as he is a dairy farmer in a more rural area near Lake Balkash. 
He spoke about staring into his reflections for some time. His most immediate reflection, the one facing him and the one of his backside, looked normal, but in every subsequent reflection further down the tunnel, he looked more and more inhuman. So he slowly stepped forward again and again, peering with concentrated, squinting eyes, and saw that in each subsequent reflection down the tunnel, he grew more arms. And in his frontward reflections, he said that his mouth was chewing on something. He saw it to be chewing gum when his reflection began blowing bubbles. Pink bubbles. Asgar then said he looked up to see the chandelier moving downward on its hoisted chain and electrical cord. He said it was being moved mechanically, methodically, and he was compelled to stay where he was. When the chandelier fell to his head, he said the two tears which at first appeared to be no more than polished bronze, became jointed legs, like of a spider or crab. The bulbs atop the plastic candles all flickered and went black. The sole light in the room somehow inexplicably came from a low green glow and reflections of himself within the mirror tunnel. He saw himself then, he said as he'd somehow impossibly always wanted to be. His face had no lower mandible now, just pinkish gore. Where his eye sockets should have been, there was simply his eyebrows and divots where his eyes should be, skin over top of them, similar to a cave salamander. But his exoskeleton, he said, was the chandelier, a golden-colored, bony and ridge-like apparatus that swirled and constricted about him. Asgar began sobbing after describing this. It was at this part of his vision that his wife was frantically trying to pull him from the lake. He apparently walked into the water until it was over his head. Had his wife Island not been there to rouse him, he would have drowned. Colleen, the woman from Kinsale in rural Ireland, was the most difficult of the 13 interviewees. She was the only to explain an addition to the foyer. She made mention of a small stand to the left wall, just behind the furthest armchair. A wooden four-legged end table with an odd piece of ceramic sculpture placed atop it. To describe it, she said... You needed to first picture a wide-brimmed hat. She described essentially a Hasidic Jewish hat, an oval top piece with a wide, straight brim extending at least six inches to the edge. She wasn't aware of what this hat might look like when asked, and so I sketched her description in my notes. She looked at my drawing with an odd concern in her eyes. She made an expression like someone was gossiping about her family. She made some corrections, asked for my pencil, and drew the brim a bit longer. She gave me back my notepad forcefully like it was repulsive to her. There was a picture of a woman on the brim, she then said, looking out the window of Dr. Phelps' office. She went on to explain that it wasn't a painting, but a photographed image of an actual woman printed in the ceramic. She was certain it was ceramic. Obviously, I wanted to know who this woman was, Colleen had never seen her before, but she looked to be dressed in a time dating at least to the early 20th century. The photographic blur and roughness of the lines attested to that. The entire sculpture, if I can call it that, is glazed in a black lacquer with white trim around the brim's edge. The photographed woman's portrait was perfectly colored to match. She wore a wide-brimmed hat herself in the portrait, with a gauze or silk veil wrapped around the sides of her face. The thought Colleen had when holding the bizarre hat-like sculpture was that it was supposed to be a ceramic or porcelain replica of the hat the woman was wearing. Colleen made it clear that the structure rested atop the end table on the base of its protruded oval center or its top if it were a hat. The bottom of the brim was solid, but the top on which it sat contained a small series of slits. They were made by whomever made the structure. 
It looked at first glance like a few coin slots, she said. But she said when she shook it in her hands and could feel that it wasn't necessarily hollow inside, and it was certainly not heavy enough to be solid. She said she walked to the center of the room, in the middle of the mirror tunnel, and remembered staring into her limitless reflections. She noticed her hands wet, warmly wet. Her discovery of her fingers and hands being wet brought her attention to the ambient temperature, which apparently fluctuates violently. She noticed then, she said, that the room was cloying in a humid temperature as if it were in the Tropic of Cancer. She doesn't know how long she was in the foyer, but she felt herself cool down after some time, looking at herself in the mirror and contemplating what was beyond each set of gray double doors. It was some time before she would come fully open to me with what she saw. I knew from the first interview that she was holding back something or things which severely distressed her. Dr. Phelps would often read over my notes and sit with the interviewees. He granted my request to interview Colleen alone as I conveyed how she seemed the most disturbed. It was her sheepdog, who had been licking her fingers and hands. That was what she'd felt when she finally came out of the hallucination. I soon hired a composite sketch artist, a woman named Kelly, who often penciled for the police. She began constructing a foyer based on my transcribed descriptions of all my interviewees. I didn't want to violate HIPAA or any other trust of the victims. She also had access to all ten public statements of the other victims whom I didn't interview. She drew a total of four sketches of this room, from the four corners vantage points, and Dr. Phelps and I looked at each other. I remember amalgamations of wonder and fear in our faces. While reading my notes, Dr. Phelps asked if he could send them to his colleague in Chapel Hill University, to a biochemist. I was elated to approve even before asking why or about whom his colleague was. Dr. Phelps only told me that his friend was experimenting on several interviewees, two of the Americans I had happened to interview, regarding their synapse responses. Dr. Phelps also pushed to get my interview notes published in the psychiatric journal and said he had several other colleagues to whom he'd like to send my notes. During the time that my notes had been sent off by Dr. Phelps, one of the two Hondurans, Maria, said that she just somehow knew in her heart of hearts that water was what lay beyond the blackness of the halls. Her translator, Sonia, had trouble with Maria's description of this supposed water. She said it was the sound of water gushing, but it created the feeling any human feels when being underwater too long or near ominous dark water. It was clearly hard for her to describe. Zozabrar was the word Maria used. Sonia said it was a word for extreme worry, anxiety, but it also had a connotation with capsizing. After my initial 13 interviews, I heard and read many rational responses from the psychiatric community, as well as different faith communities, and several statements by the AMA. I was reminded of a phenomenon around the year 2011, wherein several people on live television began speaking gibberish. Most famously was Judge Judy, but there were several news anchors whose words devolved into incoherent babble. It was a phenomenon limited in time and in scope. It happened in a rash of quickness, and just as quickly passed on, not only from astute and concerned observers, but from the general public as well. Idiosyncrasies, as the medical world, terms ailments it cannot begin to describe. History is full of such mysterious wonders. I confess that after about two months since my last interview, I was beginning to write the visions off as nothing more. It was only four months after my initial interview with Lana that Dr. Phelps had me speak with a French man who had been badly injured after falling off a scaffolding, lost in his vision of the foyer. Ari, his name was. 
He was all too eager to speak with me over Skype, and Dr. Phelps and I listened to him on the other side of the laptop. Ari and his counselor, Dr. Louis Zanier, who sat beside him, delved into his walk down the left hallway. Ari spoke good enough English to communicate well what he'd been doing before his immediate enrapturement. As an architect, he'd been walking along the side of an old building undergoing a gaudy facelift. Then, he saw himself there. I felt the dread form in my bowels the moment he mentioned the weird ceramic piece on the end table, an exact detail as Colleen's. But Ari was different than the 13 I'd interviewed. He'd been eager to walk down the left hallway. He also said, like Maria, that it was a massive body of water at the end of the hallways. But Ari was certain this water was salt water. The further he walked down the hall, he said, the thirstier he became. He said he was about to stop. He'd sank to his knees. His head was pounding so furiously in his bout of dehydration. It was then that he noticed a water fountain, affixed to the left of the wall. In stumbling toward it, he noticed that the carpet was no longer over a flat surface but over an array of what he knew to be organs, human organs. What kind of organs, I'd asked. He paused for a second. Every human organ you can imagine, he finally said. Livers, intestines, brains, hearts. He stepped deftly over each mauve carpet-covered organ in the tiny spaces between them to get to the water. But the water out of the fountain was seawater. He knew then, he said, that he'd have to get the sculpture. So he made his way back down the hallway, back toward the foyer, and picked up the sculpture. He took it down the hallway with him. He filled the sculpture up with water from the water fountain, letting it splash through the small slits in the base. He then turned it up against his mouth. It was fresh water when he drank it from the odd ceramic sculpture. After satisfying himself on the water, he wasn't concerned with finding the source of the water that he somehow knew was at the end of the hallway. Plus, he added, the outline of the organs under the hideous carpet were everywhere. I know as I sit here that if I'd stepped on one of them, it would have been one of the organs of someone I love. I had asked Ari how the water tasted, but he said he didn't remember, only that it satisfied his debilitating thirst. He said he set the sculpture back on the table and felt soothed. His initial anxiety was overturned, apparently. He said he wanted to see what laid beyond the double doors. Either sat. The doors to the north of the room, he said, would open easily enough. The hinges of the doors are set on the opposite side of the foyer. Both sets of doors, as verified by all my other interviewees, have brass handles. It is ostensible that the doors are meant to be pushed. Before he spoke about what lie beyond those gray doors, I confirmed the medications he was taking. Lexapro and Ativan for depression and anxiety. Colleen was on paroxetine for OCD symptoms, and Maria, the only other patient who'd ventured down the hall, was on lithium for her rather extreme manic phases of bipolar disorder. The blackness beyond, Ari described, was of some mammoth theater, or perhaps, he ruminated, of a church sanctuary. But he knew there was no light within. It was an opaqueness only affected by a windowless room bereft of lighting. But he thought he could see people. People of all ages, dressed in suits and dresses. So he switched back to his sanctuary description. They seemed not to notice him. That or they simply didn't pay any heed to his opening the door. He said they carried on in silence, but he could not tell exactly what it was they did. He said it could have been ritualistic, but he also couldn't shake that it was some 
eccentric performance. Hence, he couldn't determine that the place solely served as a sanctuary or a religious theater. He felt compelled to stop looking in on this macabre gathering of silence and decided he'd try the south door. Ari knew, was certain, that it would lead to a place outside. He felt that if he could walk out of these doors, he could walk out of the hallucination. As he neared the doors, he felt confident that sunlight was going to greet him. But just as he went to push open the doors, he found himself falling. Ari was the same as all of my interviewees. And of all 23 people who'd reported to have had the hallucination, healthy, consistent with their prescriptions, at or around middle age, I asked him who the woman was on the sculpture. He said with mellifluous confidence that she was the representation of humankind. To Ari, he knew that the moment he saw her picture on the ceramic thing, she was motherly at first, he'd said. He said that the foyer, whatever it might mean, was a message. That humanity is a wonderfully crafted vessel for greater powers at work. Greater unknowns. It was later that month that I received an email from Edmund, one of my original interviewees from the UK. When he wrote that he'd had another vision, more potent and lasting longer, I wasn't in the least bit surprised. In light of the research I'd been doing on the visions, I was able to get a deferment on my dissertation's defense. The phenomenon of the visions took precedent. They understood. Dr. Phelps and I were constructing a vigorous web of data analysis among all 23 victims when Edmund emailed me asking for me to call him. He'd also seen the end table with the woman's picture on it. It made him desperately thirsty. Edmund was the first to bring me into the truth of what the foyer is. He was the first to see someone he knew in the room. A childhood friend. It was a friend who he'd grown estranged from as they grew into adulthood. The last Edmund knew of his friend, Richard, he said he'd suffered from some mental break, made suicidal threats, and had gone to be observed in a psych ward. Edmund said that he'd known that Richard was later released, but hadn't heard from or spoken to him in years. When he saw him in the foyer, he stood in between the mirror tunnel and looked calm. It was after he stepped out of the tunnel that he began to slowly get on all fours and crawl to one of the nearby armchairs. Edmund couldn't remember which one. He looked to be hiding beneath the armchair, hugging his knees close to his chest, hunched over, and that's when Edmund noticed something coming out from beneath the chair. His descriptions were remarkably similar to that of Asgar when describing the chandelier ensconcing him. I asked Edmund about the chandelier, but he said nothing of it, only that it was still the sole source of light. He wasn't sure if the insectile legs writhing up from under the armchair were of Richard or simply coming out of the chair itself. But grotesque, jointed legs soon hid Richard under the chair, and the chair began bumbling in ghastly disharmony toward him. He came out of the vision shortly thereafter, screaming in his bathroom, his wife crying for him, clutching his hands. Edmund was the first to report serious depression. He said all of his memories, which used to bring about great joy in his life, meant nothing to him. Memories are usually dependable points of reference during difficult seasons. Edmund talked of how much happiness and fulfillment he'd always felt in his family and life, and he always knew that the same fullness was possible of the future, but now, he said, there was nothing in his life that would garner any excitement, any joy, or any love. He said his wedding day and the day his daughter was born the two crowning moments in his life fell flat. Finally, he said that he expected to hear from Richard, 
or someone in his family soon. He didn't know why. He just did. He'd called me from the hospital where he was being kept under observation. After Edmund, soonly thereafter, the remaining 12 were diagnosed with clinical depression. Lana had stopped eating and was presently committed at a facility funded by our own institute. She was being tube-fed, refusing to ingest anything. Colleen was on lithium. Asgar had shot himself in the head. But he'd written his wife and loved ones a detailed note explaining the necessity of his suicide. It was essentially verbatim to that of what Edmund had told me. At this time, I thought Dr. Phelps, alongside all of his colleagues, hell, alongside the entire medical community, would be digging in to fight this horrific condition or disease or whatever it was. But to my grief and shock, Dr. Phelps began comparing the victims of this hallucination with Sasquatch hunters and anyone who searches after UFOs or other non-existent beings. The phenomena, he said, was that they are probably seeing something, whether or not it's actually there, and so they proceed to ruin their lives with seeking it out. Carlos, to apparently avoid being committed in a Honduran facility, claimed his vision was entirely made up, that he'd fabricated the entire thing, simply for attention. I knew he lied out of fear. What about Kelly's sketches? I asked Dr. Phelps. He snorted in dismissal. That's why it's called a phenomenon, he said. He told me I should move past this, get on with my dissertation. He told me that being a cryptid hunting hippie didn't pay well, but the sketches are too similar. I showed them to Dr. Phelps again. He said it was summed up in the same way a psychic's cold reading was. That a foyer is a foyer, a simple room, and that anything seeming identical was simply coincidental. I was taken in with all of it. We both were, he said. Just like anything new and odd, it's exciting. But this is just another dead end. Like the gibberish people started talking on live TV a few years ago. It didn't help that a rash of false claims began exploding through the internet. After these original 23, there were memes that began circulating social media, mocking the phenomenon of the foyer. There was even a cheap mobile game that came out based on escaping the foyer. And as the year drew to a close, the foyer was abjectly discredited. There had been a number of other rooms and hallways and corridors, all with a rash of people claiming to have been trapped in their hallucinations. It was a dead trend, and once these frauds and hacks saw it, the phenomenon of envisioning places was simply urban myth. But I knew the truth. I still had the composite sketches. I had all the 13 original interviews on record, and I knew then that I'd write a book. I might exclude Carlos's account or make a special note regarding Carlos. I could decide on that later, but I couldn't just let this phenomenon go. I knew there was some secret to unlocking its purpose. No one else seemed to care about it, at least not in academia. My hours had long been finished with Dr. Phelps. Once he realized I wasn't going to let this go, that I didn't even care as much about defending my dissertation as researching these visions, he stopped calling me. I don't care about my reputation. Did Galileo? Did Mendel? So many such pioneers are often rejected or reviled by their peers. The last conversation I had with Phelps, he reminded me that all of my interviewees were on increased dosages of their original prescription. It was his last-ditch bid to divert me back to my dissertation. I tried telling him that I would continue my endeavor to understand the always-climbing prescription rate of U.S. citizens, but he couldn't see. He didn't comprehend the amazing opportunities that this strange case offered. And he couldn't defend his early interest in the phenomenon, and his writing it off now, at least not to my satisfaction. 
He told me to call him again someday if I ever pulled my head out of my rectum. It was when I had gotten back to my apartment, firm in my decision to write a book, that I saw a strange email in my inbox. As if fate were guiding me in the direction, it was sent from a psychologist, the director of a PTSD rehabilitation center in St. Helena's Island. Larry DePaulo, his name was. He had read my blog, which I'd been constantly writing regarding my initial interview notes. A mutual colleague with Phelps had forwarded a copy of Asgar's interview notes to him, and he wanted to meet me. In his email, he included his cell phone number below his office line. He urged me to call him whenever convenient, so ostensibly I called him soon after reading his brief email, but not before considering whether or not I should ask Phelps about him. I decided not to, with not much deliberation either. Dr. DePaulo was born in Lisbon. I gathered he was born into a family of behemoth money. He'd purchased 17 acres in St. Helena back in 1999, with the intent of not only rehabilitating and treating PTSD patients, but also to explore and develop innovative therapy techniques. He said the Mending Light Center remains at full occupancy year-round with 25 participants and 18 on staff, eight licensed trauma counselors, two psychiatrists, and eight nurses. The center is obviously very small group focused and very intimate, Dr. DiPaolo had said. He would cover my trip there and back, provide the luxurious housing accommodations the center had to offer, and grant me full access to every inch of the program. He said that a patient's denial of experiencing a traumatic event, whether physical or psychological, is addressed directly within the 12-step program the center offered. I think it could be of significance to you in your dealing with patients like Carlos, he told me. A rejuvenating excitement flowed over me then. It was a vindicating feeling to be believed. Before hanging up with Dr. DePaulo, he'd purchased first-class tickets to St. Helena from Pittsburgh. I was booked to leave in two days. I didn't care what Dr. Phelps' opinion of the man would be. None of my academic colleagues would care about my leaving without telling them either. I had never been to this part of the world before. Certainly not the Bahamas or Bermuda. St. Helena's. It was cosmic in how gorgeous it was. DePaulo was at the airport waiting for me. His eyes were the first thing I saw on the gargantuan man. Calm and rather sedated, but emotionless. His lips were vaguely creased upward in a smile, but his gray eyes remained neutral as coal. DePaulo had to be pushing 400 pounds. He was no taller than six feet, and he had a richly talented tailor. He greeted me cordially, affirming my identity. He walked with apparent struggle, waddling to and fro, and I was glad for both our sakes that he didn't offer to carry any of my baggage, which wasn't much at all. A taxi was waiting for us out front, and as the driver got out to put my bags in the trunk, DePaulo and I took our seats in the back. Dr. DePaulo didn't have much to say. It was almost unnerving. I was talking to him mostly about deferring my doctoral defense and my feeling estranged from the rest of the doctoral community. He nodded genuinely, but spoke seldomly. His accent was undoubted. He smiled and shook his head in the affirmative a lot and said, Oh, yes, and sure, a lot. We hadn't been on the road for long, probably five or six minutes from the airport, when the doctor offered me a stick of gum. Bubblegum bliss was the flavor. I took a stick and began chewing it. I noticed that Dr. DePaulo had been chewing gum. Had he been chewing gum when I first met him on the tarmac? Regardless, he stuck a new stick in and began chewing loudly on it. As I continued talking to him about all the flack and mockery the foyer phenomenon was getting, he began blowing bubbles. 
I had been raised to believe in rural Utica, New York, that blowing bubbles was rude. Even chomping down noticeably on bubblegum, I was taught, was a bit rude. This large stranger, I realized then, was just that. I really knew nothing about the man. His website, the Mending Light Center, it all checked out, and I looked this guy up on LinkedIn, and he certainly was legitimate. I skimmed through an article he'd written in Psychology Tomorrow from around eight or nine years ago. He seemed fine, I told myself, but I got trace feelings of doom sitting in the back of the taxi with him. He just wasn't as talkative or responsive as he'd been on the phone. He began speaking to me about golfing on the resort neighboring the center, and though I'd never played around, the thought of guzzling beer and poking around a manicured course in the tropics thrilled me. It helped put me at ease about the massive Dr. Larry DePaulo, even as I noticed that his charcoal eyebrows were painted on. When the cab pulled to the front gate, a uniformed security guard nodded us through, and I thought it was a tad weird that the facility was gated. But being unfamiliar with things like vagrancy and theft in this gorgeous island, I brushed it off. It was maybe a quarter of a mile that the drive curved back and forth amidst the palm trees and shrubbery. The warm hum of katydids and cicadas filled the heated late afternoon air, and I was taken aback when I first saw the main entrance to the place. There was a marble monument standing by a promenade reading, Welcome, and marble steps leading upward to glass doors. It was glaringly clear to me then why most insurance plans didn't send people this way. This was a rehab center for celebrities and politicians of that I was certain. I heard the Atlantic waves crashing against a nearby beach, and I was instantly elated at the thought of exploring the crystal-watered shores. Even as the obnoxious bubble popping of Dr. DePaulo's gum brought me back in the moment of lifting my baggage out of the cab's trunk, I was more excited now, exponentially so, than any nervousness I'd had in the cab ride. Well, hello there. I know you're eager to find out the ending of this titillating tale, but let's take a brief intermission and let me tell you all about Green Chef. Green Chef is a USDA certified organic company with so many options to choose from. Meal plans include paleo, vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, Mediterranean, heart smart, lean and clean, keto, gluten free, and omnivore. Recipes are quick and easy with step-by-step -step instructions, chef tips, and photos to guide you along. With Green Chef, it's easy to eat well and discover new recipes every week that you'll love to cook. Now, this is something that is really important to me personally. I love cooking, but I can get into kind of a food slump if I don't change it up a bit week to week. So Green Chef has my back there. With Green Chef's wide variety of high quality, clean ingredients, you can feel great about what you're eating and how it got to your table. And one thing I really appreciated with Green Chef was each recipe comes with nutrition facts. You can even go right now to their website without even signing up and look up what meals are available and everything about them. I went with the omnivore category and my absolute favorite recipe from the omnivore option was paella with barramundi. It also comes with roasted butternut squash and bell pepper and green olives. I've never had paella with butternut squash before, and let me tell you, it was an excellent addition to the traditional dish. For $50 off your first box of Green Chef, go to greenchef.us slash scare. You heard me right, folks. This is an insane deal. For $50 off your first box of Green Chef, go to greenchef.us slash scare. I glanced at my watch and saw it was approaching 7.30 in the evening. 
So I asked Apollo about curfews or lights out policies. He didn't answer immediately, but his face remained deadpan. I thought perhaps he hadn't heard me, but he finally said, Participants are to remain indoors after nine, but we concede to individual discrepancies for those who wish to walk some of our lighted greenways. All of the campus is under 24 hour surveillance. He went on to explain that only those without any infractions and generally further along in the program were allowed special concessions. Everyone else, namely newer participants, had to remain in their rooms with lights out by 9 p.m. Even as he explained this, he spoke as though reading from an instruction manual. Uncertain, laboriously scripted. He showed me to my suite, complete with a gargantuan flat screen, a fully tiled bathroom with a stand-in shower and a hot tub bath. Next to the queen bed was a sliding door leading to a balcony overlooking what I could tell was a five-star view. The furniture was exquisite, mahogany wardrobe and leather armchairs. Along the hallways of the main corridors, DePaulo began, you can see our exquisite collection of marine life. It's a part terrarium, part aquarium. It's something we are quite proud of. There are species of fish and fauna from different parts of the world, and our participants are their caretakers. I think I merely cocked my head at his saying this, and with a bulging open palm, he beckoned me to follow him. I hope you'll find the accommodations to your liking during your stay, Dr. DiPaolo had said, as he led me from my room to the dining hall. He said dinner was at 5.45 every evening, but that there was still an entree and accompanying dishes on the warmers for me. The food was catered from a local cafe, and it was delectable, even if having sat for two hours. It was a gouda cheese and tempeh ravioli with a spinach Greek salad complete with garlic bread, and a sweet phyllo bread dessert. There was a coffee thermos pump filled with an organic brand name I recognized as highest quality. I was shown the general snack cabinet, and among the varied and all very expensive sundries, I noticed baskets full of different kinds of gum. Gum by the packets, every type and flavor you could imagine. I remember commenting on the plethora of it, and DePaulo behind me said that chewing gum is especially utilized in his program as an alternative to tobacco. Cigarettes often go hand in hand with abusive disease processes especially alcoholism and opioid addictions, he said. I only noticed then that he was still chewing his gum from the cab. The entire time I'd been eating dinner, he sat across from me, watching a TV screen hanging from the wall behind me. He'd gotten himself a cup of herbal tea. It was when we'd left that he showed me the terrariums lining the bottom right half of the main hallway. A painted mural of ocean life and coral reef lined both walls, and the hallway was at least 40 feet long. I saw then a coconut crab, still, close to the terrarium glass. I had to look at it for several seconds to make sure it wasn't a prop. We have nine of these crustacean critters, remarked DePaulo as he stepped up beside me. That's a big, large to be considered a critter, isn't it? I remember asking him. He chuckled lightly. We can learn much from the life of one of these marvelous crabs. In early life, they move from shell to shell before finally outgrowing any shell that they can fit their adult bodies, and then they take the leap of being without a shell. Their skin toughens and hardens. It is the perfect metaphor of an addict. I must have looked puzzled, but didn't say anything. It was Shortly after this that he told me he needed to soon start his bedtime routines. I thanked him again, and then he went on to speak for probably some 30 minutes on various talking points regarding the program. He was apparently not in a glowing mood that night, I decided. His eyes rarely looked up from the floor, and through his deadpan expression he seemed pained to be going through with this formality. 
He made a final comment about the surrounding golf resort and then said he was going to bed. He said he was an early sleep, early rise practitioner, and as it was well past 8 p.m., I shook his hand and told him I'd see him back there in the dining hall at 7 a.m. to be introduced to everyone as a fellow participant. He showed me the way to the lounge on his way to his quarters. In the lounge, a giant screen TV was playing some boisterous sports commentary program, and there were two plush couches, recliners and armchairs encircling a colossal coffee table, underneath of which were stacks of board games and other social accoutrements. I saw that the room narrowed to a hallway in the back, and as I walked down it, there were landline phones against the wall to my right, and to my left were windows spaced three or four feet apart, showcasing a skyline of palm trees. I saw billiards and an air hockey table in the adjoining room at the end of the hallway, and more recliners. I gasped when I first saw a program participant. He was perhaps 400 pounds, maybe 40, tall, I could tell though he was slouched back on a recliner. A walker stood beside it. His face was looking at me, emotionless, and it sagged severely to the left. He was obviously a stroke patient. On his lap was a tablet. It rested against a left arm which was paralyzed, and his gut. With his right, he was scrolling and tapping on its screen. I was startled when a clearly automated voice began speaking to me. Hi, you must be new, it said in a bleak monotone. I introduced myself as a researcher who'd been invited by Dr. DePaolo to observe the program. I noticed his lips were trying ever so subtly to mouth what he typed on the screen. His name was Blake. He'd been an alcoholic for at least a decade, he'd said, falling in and out of a 12-step program several times. He was a broker who'd lost a majority of the firm he still owned, and had actually been a part of the resort's program when it first launched in 2002. My face couldn't have hidden the puzzlement I felt. So, you completed the program in 02? I asked. Kicked out. The voice replied almost immediately. I paused to let him type some more was asked to leave for not taking the program seriously enough, went back to Manhattan, did okay for a bit, got in good with A, started going to a big church, made a lot of friends, kept crashing every few months, then had this happen to me one morning. They let me come back. I was nodding my head, giving him his deserved time. Clear drool began to softly stream out of the left side of his mouth. It had been pooling there for a while, and I knew it would only be a matter of time before it spilled out. Blake had kept a kerchief waiting underneath his tablet. Lots of participants get kicked out and then invited back, he said. I learned from Blake that four of the current program's 27 participants were members of Congress. I was prepared then to ask Blake a few more questions about the resort and facilities as... Despite his handicaps, he seemed as lonely as I'd been and happy to chat away. But almost in the same sentence as describing the four state-level senators in the program, all of whom I'd never heard of and cared nothing about, Blake asked if my research dealt with nostalgia. I asked him what he meant. It's the key to recovery here. The tablet's voice read, He went on to explain that when we indulge our addictions for so long, we develop what DePaulo termed nostalgia syndrome, which paints all our past prior to addiction as desirable, even if it wasn't. But to ensure the dopamine released by the memories keeps flowing, we use again, or in Blake's instance, drink. Yet, Blake suggested to me that the reason he was invited back was due to his stroke, He said he suffered PTSD from the night he realized he was having it. But this nostalgia syndrome was something I hadn't come across on the program's website or on Dr. DePaulo's personal website. I told Blake that I had been contacted by DePaulo because of an article I wrote on the foyer phenomenon. Blake didn't respond. So I asked him, You know what I'm talking about, right? 
After what seemed like minutes looking into his tablet screen, Blake only nodded his head. He didn't seem to be interested in it. In fact, it seemed as though the only thing he was truly interested in was what he wanted to say, and I could appreciate that. I listened to him talk through his software for some time, probably upwards of 15 minutes. He spoke about the different perks of the program and the resort's garish facilities, but Then he told me that nostalgia was like the final shell of a coconut crab. He said that it's a leitmotif in the program, a crab outgrowing its shell. But Blake also called them robber crabs, as I knew them also to be named. I was frustrated when a nurse walked in, just as he was beginning to expound. Just 20 or so minutes before, I'd have been quite excited to meet a staff member here at the resort but this timing was beyond awful. He said he had physical therapy to go to. I asked if I could help with anything, getting him in, out of his seat, or whatnot. But the nurse, whose name I didn't catch, got defensive. Yes, you were expected, were you not? She said, more than asked, in a perfunctory way. You'll get to meet everyone tomorrow. She said this as she took his tablet and helped him stand into his walker. I had enough to cogitate on. That was definite. Certainly, DePaolo read my own expositions on Asgar and Edmund's description of the crab legs. Was that why he took such an interest in my being here at his rehab center? Why? The very unpleasant truth came when I first walked out of the break lounge, probably some thirty minutes after Blake's nurse had escorted him. I walked into a corridor from which... Five different hallways connected. But there was a glass door to a walkway outside, and when I went to open it, I saw that it was locked. So I walked around the main terrarium and mural hallway, from which I could get to the cafeteria. There had been an outside access door at the end of it. The cafeteria door itself was closed, assuredly locked, though I didn't try it. Some of the same snacks that were in the communal snack cabinet in the cafeteria now sat on a table, which sat in front of the door to the outside. Obviously, it was meant to be a barrier. I reached over the snack table and jerked the handle. I didn't like that. I took out my phone and there was no service, which I half expected. When I opened the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth settings, I didn't see anything in network. Surely this place had internet. But first, I'd need to find someone to ask. I was mad at myself then for not asking Apollo myself what the Wi-Fi password was, or even what the Wi-Fi situation was. From what my phone was telling me, there wasn't any. But that couldn't be the case. It couldn't. I, I walked down the main hallway, which housed several suites, to the main glass double doorways which I'd entered not an hour earlier locked. There was no front desk, no area for a receptionist or some administrative staffer. I realized how alone I was. The lights throughout the place were bright enough, but the place was crypt-like. I hastily began walking toward my room. Then I began jogging, but something then came over me. What was I going to do once I got back into my room? Sit on that gargantuan bed and pretend nothing was awry? Watch TV? I became angry, and I remember the direction DePaulo had walked after showing me the TV lounge. All the doors leading outside had been locked, so I didn't expect one of the oaken doors to a random suite to open, but it did. I still don't know why I opened it, but no one was in it. It was perfectly put together and looked identical to my own. I had hoped that DePaolo's door was unlocked as well, but regardless, I was going to pound on it until he opened it. Why wouldn't he tell me I was locked in here? About midway through the hall, I found two intricately carved wooden doors, different from all the others. Carved into it were starfish, with impressive detail in every weird ridge and bump. There was some coral reef and a few distant fish in the foreground. It was a sight which elicited looking over for some time, but I was still heated. I knocked sternly on the door and jiggled the handle. 
It opened. The suite was unlike mine and the other one. It opened into what looked to be some sort of dining room, easily 1,000 square feet. Little round tables with ocean-themed tablecloths draped over them and dappled the carpeted floor. And to the left was a small stage and podium. The farthest wall opened up to a glass-covered balcony overlooking the beachfront. Back against the right wall was a closed door, and I heard talking on the other side. It was rush talking, at least between two people, and there was a hastiness I could make out. A forced quietness. I quickly stepped as gingerly as I could, flattening myself against the wall beside it. Unmistakably, I heard the voice of DiPaolo. He was trying his damnedest to placate someone. Yes, I understand that, but Blake is eager to pay up front, in cash, I heard DiPaolo say in a subdued tone. I don't give a damn about that, snapped a woman's voice. This is about so much more than money. Or do you still believe that, doctor? The derision in her tone was palpable. And then another man's voice popped in. Calmer and clearer. She's right, Larry. Blake can't expect to just reap the benefits here because he has money. We have his mightiness to provide for. He needs to find another brood. There's no shortage of cash flow amongst our participants either. At least until tonight, isn't that right? The woman's voice boomed in again. I'm sorry, sister. I heard DiPaolo begin. But the man is a personal friend and confidant with Miles Phelps, and he's still prying. Let him pry, the woman retorted. No one is going to take him seriously anyway. Hell, we've spent well over nine grand in press getting him and the phenomenon debunked. My blood stopped in its arteries and veins then. Was Blake just being sucked for his money? Had they paid Carlos to say his entire vision was made up? Were they paying other people to keep silent about their visions? Only one thing rang clear to me then. Standing on the other side of that wall, I had to get out of that place. If it meant shattering every glass door and window, I had to get out of this place. Run for help, get the police. I didn't even know what the police force on a small British Commonwealth island looked like. I turned and saw people behind me. Two young men dressed like professional golfers, both blowing bubbles annoyingly loud. A tall, older woman stood behind them, and down to her right in an automated wheelchair sat a behemoth of a man. His eyes were slits, but I could see his eyebrows, or where they should be was a series of earrings. He had oxygen supplying his nostrils in little tubes, tiny against his mammoth face. I tried to say excuse me as I began darting around the odd group of people. I knew that they meant trouble, and as I started my gallop, I knew it. But even as I felt a sharp, stinging jolt in my ribs, I didn't see any of them come at me. Everything ended then in steadying blackness. When I woke up, I was on green shag carpet. I heard the soft hum of a motorized wheelchair buzzing past me. I was in a gargantuan room. It looked like some sort of theater, but the white walls were barren, and I could see by their indentions that the room was some sort of octagonal shape. The ceiling was plain white with four sets of grandiose chandeliers. On a hospital bed sat a monstrosity, but it was human, I could see, a man. He could have weighed a thousand pounds, probably 800 more realistically. He appeared to be naked, but I saw a man in scrubs, perhaps a nurse, pull something from beneath his massiveness, a soiled diaper. I smelt then, even waking in a groggier state than I'd ever been, 
the unmistakable stench of human bowel movements. Now, here you have an honest man looking for clarity, said another man, whom I hadn't noticed. Sitting on a weighted down recliner sat another behemoth of a man, perhaps not quite as big, but easily 500 pounds. I wanted to open my mouth, to curse, to ask what, where the hell I was, even to moan, but my throat felt drier than anything I'd ever felt, like drawing a deep breath of sawdust. I tried to swallow, to generate any drop of saliva from within my arid mouth, and with the pain lighting its way from the roof of my mouth down to my esophagus, I was able to swallow. It didn't seem to wet my throat. My limbs felt paralyzed still. Whatever I'd been shocked or tased with carried some sort of toxin. Dr. DePaolo stepped away from me, and I saw in his eyes that same deadpan glumness. DePaolo's sister was also very large. Her name, if I remember rightly, was Cynthia. DePaolo had said her name, and she snapped back with something along the lines of, Don't dare patronize me, brother. Unmistakably, his blood relative, she wore a summer dress that came down somewhere around her knees. I could see that her ankles were swollen with fluid, and her feet smothered the sandal she was wearing. Her eyes were sociopathic. What in Poseidon's name did you hit him with? she asked, not taking her eyes off me. He started running, had to drop him. I heard that violent staccato from a taser somewhere behind me. Then the naked behemoth, who was currently having his rectum wiped by a latex-gloved hand of the nurse, spoke. I could barely see his eyes in between the folds of flesh. Stand him up he said. With that, Dr. DePaolo and the man standing on the other side of his sister, presumably the calm voice I heard, stooped down and grabbed me under my arms. When they lifted me up, it felt like being drunk and falling on the floor. I knew it shouldn't feel good when gruffly thrown into a wheelchair, but somehow the numbness I felt from the toxins were comforting. The cushioned chair I sat on apparently had wheels, as I was moved to face the entire convocation of my abductors. Dr. DePaolo stood in front of me, his belly more prominent than ever, or at least his shirt was a size too small. His hands dug around in drilling motions in his khaki pants. Chupacabra, Bigfoot, UFOs, any number of paranormal sightings, if they are indeed true sightings, have one thing in common. The witness becomes obsessive. Well, ever so often they don't, but simply give a statement, which inevitably becomes evidence of the sighting. But regardless, the myths circulate. Just as his bizarre accented words ended, I saw visions. I saw images of Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, all which should be humorous under a normal context, but it was blatantly clear what DePaolo was implying. We have simply upped the ante, showing people a place which actually exists. The results have confirmed our hope. After these words, Dr. DePaolo nodded at someone behind me. The hum of the obese invalid's motorized wheelchair buzzed next to me. As it became apparent, we were all going somewhere as a group. Stop, I heard a voice say. Let me get a better look. It was a mellifluously soft voice from the colossus on the hospital bed. A white towel had been draped over his loins. 
The nurse was applying what looked to be a wet washcloth to the mammoth man's head and neck. I was wheeled next to him and never before have I smelt such pungent sweat and body odor. I'm not sure how long he looked at me before gently saying, Good. Good. Then, led by Dr. DiPaolo and his sister, we headed toward a single gray wooden door with a brass handle. In this time, I found my voice had faithfully returned. Uh, What do you mean? I groggily said. I knew DiPaolo heard me, but it was Cynthia who nudged his arm. Hey, your golden egg is talking to you, she said to him. Oh, I'd rather just show. It has a much more efficient outcome. And then I was being pushed through the open door. I'd come through the sanctuary, the same place which Edmund had described, bereft of light but filled with people. I was in the foyer now. DiPaolo stood in between the mirrors, and the large man on the electric wheelchair pulled up beside him. I heard a pair of clippers turn on next to me, then I saw it was DiPaolo's sister applying them to my head. I tried so insanely hard to lift my hands, to even move my head an inch and put up some sort of a struggle, but it was like being in a dream and forced to run. I couldn't feel the clippers, but I saw clumps of my hair dropping all about me. I'm growing a bit wary of doing your nutbag chores for you, Larry. You owe me. Dr. DiPaolo swatted her mindlessly. I was about to ask who or what or why, but all that came out was a mixture of all three. Our hopes were confirmed, Dr. DePaolo said again. No one takes the phenomenon seriously, just as no one takes a Sasquatch sighting seriously. At least, no one important, that is. No one will take you seriously either if you go on to report what you saw here, but you'll have absolutely no desire to do that after we finish with you. For the first time, I saw... Dr. Larry DePaolo grin as he looked at everyone in the room but me. The obese man in the wheelchair began inching toward me, and he blew a pink bubble which he quickly sucked back into his mouth. He closed his eyes as if meditating, and then his face began to collapse in on itself. More aptly, it began to shift into something else. I wanted to shriek so loudly that all I could do was whimper in disbelief. Uh, Not, not. I managed. I kept trying to get out not possible. I couldn't accept it, but this giant man's face disappeared inwardly, and folds of flesh to either side closed in. The rapidly sucking and folding skin sounded like a thousand cell phone wrappers being ripped and torn open. Ridges were forming on the skin, and where his scalp would have been, a sinkhole of hair and skin formed, being sucked into the gaping chasm forming down his face and throat. Then his arms shot out like he was seizing. They became rigid beams. The hanging skin beneath his arms suddenly formed little stalactites, larger ridge formations that his face flesh had formed. His voice was uttering some monotone grunt, but it was slowly being overtaken by the much louder, wet, swishing sounds of his skin flab metamorphing. He'd been wearing a floral button-down short sleeve, likely silk. His shorts were khaki material, and his two massive legs straightened outward. His shorts ripped apart, 
Down the center of his immense legs, the rippling chasm continued. I saw what was once his head and neck elongate, or rather, where his shoulders once were, they dropped to his midsection. A giant pink bubble formed and bulged from the top most crevice that was once his face. He's especially hungry, commented DePaulo's sister. The buzzing of the clippers had ceased now. After the grotesque noise of the obese man's transformation came to a quiet throbbing, and the thing pulsed to it like the rhythm of a pulse. Each of the five appendages quivered with each pulse. Not just yet, my friend, Dr. DePaolo said, and then he crouched on all fours, slowly and deliberately. Oh, no, you don't, shot his sister, who stepped in front of me. She got on all fours, and I saw a look of shame cross the doctor's face. You owe me, she said. What in the hell are you? I managed. Dr. DePaolo, still on his hands and knees, looked at me, and there was a redness in his eyes. Inhuman. At the very least, let him know before we have him, his sister said. Dr. DePaolo's eyes were that of an overdose victim's. Solid red covered where once white had been, and his pupils were small black dots. I saw them hover on me. He spoke with a voice that was not his own. I don't believe it was a whisper, but loud and perfectly audible, as though he was whispering into my ear while being ten or twelve feet in front of me. We have been on this planet. Longer than you are kind. His voice rasped. It was filled with malice. We were pushed out of our rightful plane of existence by your meddling kind. We have been exiled in a diaspora because of weak and cowardly humankind. As these words were being hissed, I saw something emerge from his hunched sister's form. Her shoulder-length hair was thick and hung to either side of her head. But I saw two orbs raising up from in front of her head, small, bloody, protruding tubules. I also heard a ripping sound accompanying it. I couldn't tell what it was at first. I saw her summer dress suddenly drop to either side of her body. It had been ripped in half. You would refer to us as arthropods. Without us, your pathetic race, and all of your wallowing, warm-blooded mammals would be dead within days. We are everywhere microscopic on your skin our larger kinds who live in the old way in the oceans them you eat as cuisine we are the ones who live in the unseen dimensions among you at this time I saw flesh toned jointed legs glistening and dripping profusely, appear in obscene silence beneath the shredded dress. The two bloody orbs kept growing longer, noiselessly from her head. We take shells also, unseen homes to shelter us in the seen and tangible world world. We make your memories our homes. The fungi you disregard as brainless 
and the non-sentient also suffered our fate. They were ejected from their rightful place by your weak race. But they cannot communicate on your base levels of communication. And we share with them must eat your memories to live, and we must live in them to live. It was then that lights flickered on either side of me, down the darkened halls. I moved my head to my right where I sensed movement out of the corner of my eye. The hall must have curved out of vision some thirty feet ahead, but I saw a human form walking slowly. A person I knew. It was Askar. I was only able to whisper his name. His face wore a grimace, and he looked to be at least thirty pounds lighter, and he had not been overweight. He was certainly now underweight. I have moved my dull head to my neck, ignoring the inhumanly convulsing monstrosity in the now shredded summer dress. The left hall curved in the same fashion, and I saw Edmund stepping delicately, deliberately over the mauve carpet. Behind that same bend came Colleen, then Carlos. I heard the crick in my neck pop as I turned my head to the left. My head, I realize now, had been laying almost flat against my shoulder as it was being shaved. It had been slumped since they sat me in the wheelchair. It hurt worse than any bad sleeping position I can remember, even through the sedatives and their waning effectiveness. All the interviewees were cascading down the halls on either side. They walked slower than normal, but otherwise their mannerisms seemed normal enough. They all looked at me, and I at them. I know my eyes were hoarsely shrieking, why? But they kept their lips closed as they gathered in the foyer. And then I looked down by my feet again, and I saw her. Or what had once been her. With all my concentration, I pulled my left foot up, away from the abomination. It was like a lead anvil hung around my ankles. Apparently the sedative was wearing off top down. All of my former patients, as well as all of the victims around the globe, all 23 of them, seemed not to notice the monstrous starfish thing in the wheelchair, or the coffee table-sized crab, a coconut crab, or a giant hermit crab without its shell, quietly hunched on its vile legs. My head itched, and before remembering I'd been shaved, I officially swung my head in a motion to get my formerly long acorn-colored hair out of my face, but it was one of her antennae. She was rotating to face me, her stumpy, spider-like legs jolting into the mauve carpet like a machine. It sounded so loud, like a turret press stamping into steel. All 23 of the victims of this vision, of this hellish place, all stood behind the doctor and his human starfish friend. They are prepared, Dr. DePaolo said, prepared to enter the outside world different than how they came here. Why? I whispered, looking at each of them, not twenty feet away from me. But Dr. Larry DePaolo soon took back my attention. He was undergoing the same metamorphosis as his sister. I watched his red eyes begin shooting up from his sockets like stalks of some weed, making weird 
gurgling sounds. Your joy. What you derive from all your memories, I will live in. My disappearance will be a mystery, as will yours. His hushed, hissing whisper said, and then his mouth vanished beneath folds of grisly skin and cartilage. He took your nostalgia, I slowly said to the vision victims behind him, and then Asgar stepped forward. I faked my own death, he said in a staunch accent. Tears were streaming down his face. Memories are meaningless to us now, said Colleen, who also was streaming tears. After he takes your nostalgia, you can choose to live on as we do, or you can offer it as food. Colleen's eyes shifted toward the pulsing starfish. One of the men who'd been pushing my wheelchair, one of the cowardly bastards who'd tased me, spoke up then. No, he said. This one goes to Tick, father. His blood is pure. Behind me, I heard the great gray doors open, and with it a squeaking sound. I knew it to be hospital bed wheels being pushed against manicured carpet. A bevy of men and scrubs pushed it, and the mass of flab atop it was groaning gently. He was pushed beside DiPaolo, in between the mere tunnel. DiPaolo was inhuman now. Where his left arm had once been, he had a massive lump of pink white and peach colored cartilage which curved into a grotesque pincer. His eyes were two bloody stalks with beady little black stalks atop them and what were once his clothes simply amounted to a pink rubble of wet cloth on its carapace. I began having memories then. Intrusive thoughts shoved into the forefront of my mind. Memories of Easter Sunday lamb shanks with my grandparents. Memories of my cousins coming to stay at my parents' house with me in Montana. These thoughts were always the ones that made me wish I could be there again and escape the present. There was no feeling in them. I could feel an emptiness there. I could physically feel a nothingness like looking at the stock photos that come in store-bought picture frames. But I was also intrigued, and these subhuman animals didn't expect that. I was intrigued by the grotesqueness of the mammoth on the gurney. He was somehow more inhuman than DiPaolo and his sister, or the bloated starfish in the wheelchair. The behemoth was the biggest poser of them all. Where do you want to start? I saw a man in scrubs ask him. The bedridden man replied in soft, almost inaudible voice. Cartoid, I think I heard him say. With all my strength, I attempted to lift both hands, and I felt some small response in my dominant right arm. I was just able to lift my right arm from the armrest of the wheelchair maybe about an inch at most. They didn't notice. I felt gruff, ungloved hands marking on my neck with something cold. I realized it was a marker for whomever might be making an incision over my artery. Do we need restraints? came a male voice. Not if you hurry up and bring him here, said the behemoth. I realized then that I had been moaning trying to shout. My eyes scanned the lineup of former victims, thirteen of whom I'd interviewed. Come on, is this actually necessary? asked Colleen. This is going to be too much. Can't we just- You will watch me drink him! This is your collective penalty for seeking to escape, the behemoth shouted. 
It was the loudest I'd heard him yet, but I noticed by the way he kept licking his lips that he was getting hungry, and then I saw Asgar looking at me pitifully. He was sobbing. I'm not sure how it works. Still to this day, but it's our feelings about what to do more than our thoughts that... What? I'm not sure how it works still to this day. It's our feelings about what to do more than our thoughts that we can communicate to each other. With everyone who's had their nostalgia burgled, we can communicate our innermost thoughts to each other somehow. I don't think DiPaolo or anyone really knew how, which is why remaining on the resort on St. Helena's is so pivotal. But my hunch was read by Asgar. This Tick Father, as they called him, if he is indeed a Tick, was kept from bursting by the force of the Mirror Tunnel. That was what I so wanted to do, to jump up from my sedated paralysis and shatter one of those mirrors. Both of the mirrors, I wanted to shatter them and then attack the fiends with a long shard of glass. But as it turns out, a far less dramatic action was required. Oscar suddenly jumped to one of the mirrors and picked it up, carrying it off the wall and hugging it to his chest. The next thing I remember was being bathed in gore. The tick man burst, and everyone in the foyer was drenched. This thing who had burst apart was clearly the leader of the otherworldly interlopers. I quickly connected with everyone's bloodlust as I sat motionless in the wheelchair. I noticed one of the victims rush that end table and pick up that piece of ceramic ornamentation shaped like a rabbi's hat. Then the thirst came. Realization came to me that this middle-aged woman, a stranger to me who'd meant to work in concert with violently attacking these abominations, was overcome with desire or need. She grabbed the ceramic piece and tipped it to her mouth, and water trickled out of those strange slots atop it. I heard several voices shout, no, stop. Somehow they knew perhaps they'd also drink from it in their visions. The crab that had once been DePaolo's sister now had the woman's left knee trapped in her pincer, and a sickly ripping sound came out of nowhere as her leg below the knee disappeared in a haze of awful burgundy. One of the men who'd been pushing my wheelchair ran to intercept the ceramic piece, whatever was in it. Whether or not it was water, they wanted to keep it safe. But the man who'd been pushing the wheelchair soon was overtaken by the victims. The woman was being ripped apart by the monstrous crab, and the lone man who'd rushed her to take the ornament was being bashed to death by it. A revolting clunk shattered it and his skull. The older woman, who'd been with the two goons in golf clothes, had morphed into a smaller crab and she slowly made her way to the gray double doors just behind us. Asgar picked her up, no longer than ten inches, by her pincers. The initial charging woman lay in grotesque pieces, but the crab of DePaolo's sister had shrunk to perhaps a foot or maybe two. The mirror began to crack as they pounded the starfish with it. DePaolo had also shrunk to about the same size. Asgar and Edmund were crushing the starfish, now smaller than a foot in length, with the edge of the mirror. There were the two men in golf clothes who'd been pushing my wheelchair. I can't remember exactly now the chronology of it, but I was standing upright. The sedative had all but worn off. One of the men had been gashed about the throat and face with a broken piece of mirror. The man, still living, was being held down and a glass shard was being held to his jugular. What does that water do? Colleen asked him. It's the essence of unseen places, 
the man said. Unless we drink it, we can never adapt. Someone else then said, Adapt? You mean change into these monstrosities? Would she have changed? Asked Colleen, pointing to the woman's corpse. It depends. Everyone requires different amounts, the hostage replied. Then someone in the group asked the man if he could change. He didn't reply. I made it clear to him that we were only sparing his life for information. I asked him who the picture of the woman on the ceramic was. He smiled wryly. Our matriarch, he said quietly. She wouldn't come out of the ether realm into this dump. Someone asked him how many of his kind were in the world. He began laughing. From what I gathered, various crustaceans and ticks and starfish like himself populated the earth as interlopers. I knew then that blowing bubbles was in fact their transformed stomach membranes, peeking out of their human mouths. We made him transform into one of the starfish. He was only able to morph from the waist up. He was feeble and flopped about helplessly between his two legs and three phalanges on the carpet. Given enough time, this well-bred man in nice clothing, the man who wasn't slain, who we took as our captive, he would have become powerful enough to eat our hopes and dreams. But he was a helpless starfish now. And Larry and Cynthia DePaolo, they'd never live in another person's memories. We took the rest of the facility staff, a psychiatrist named Barry Horace, whom we'd intercepted when he arrived at 10 a.m. the next morning. We had him call in the other shrink, a young woman named Michelle Clarkson. I thought she, of all the faculty, might be genuinely naive and clean amidst these interlopers. Even when I saw her blow a small pink bubble, we waited for each of the eight counselors to come in one by one and held them with the two psychiatrists and the other eight nurses in the boiler room. The nurse who'd been in charge of changing the invalid's diaper, we held him for a while in the soiled diaper bin. In the end, we made them all transform. Many of them, such as the pretty Dr. Clarkson, was barely able to morph past a forearm or shoulder. In the end, we forced all of them into the terrarium. Blake, we found, headless. Or rather, where his head should have been was the phalanges of a starfish. In his room, we found a cooler and a mini fridge. For a long time, we kept Dr. DePaolo in the fridge. His sister, we kept in the cooler. The third older woman whom Asgar had intercepted, we threw in the terrarium with the other crabs. We didn't feed them, but I knew that at least Dr. DePaolo still lived because every time I thought about my happiest moments, I could feel somehow in my mind a giant shellless crab. I saw it, him, transposed in all my fondest thoughts. The others did too. I would jolt my head this way or that to get a stray hair out of my face, only to realize it was one of DePaolo's antennae, swaying in between realities. My head, I'd realized dully, was still shaved. We all voted on Larry and Cynthia and decided to kill them both with some maintenance equipment we found in the closet. We all took turns crushing the bodies with a maddox and a hoe. We clipped them into pieces with shears and then burnt them in a fire pit on the beach. Eventually, we put the unnamed one, the half-man, half-starfish, in the terrarium with the other crabs and the older lady whose name I'll never know. And it's still a mystery as to whether she was eaten or whether she still lives. And the half-starfish man, he perhaps still flops to and fro. There were only small pools of salt water in the terrarium, and not knowing much about the physiology of starfish, I don't know how long they can survive in so little water. 
To my knowledge, all original nine crabs were left in there before we voted again. It had been four days when we all decided to burn the foyer. Eventually, people would come looking for DiPaolo. Blake might have family. We knew the entire facility wouldn't be burned. The gate guardsmen would be alarmed before too much damage could commence. Many of the victims were thought to be dead. I realized then how easy it would be to make the world believe I too was dead. Cynthia DePaolo was a North Carolina state senator. The woman and the two men in golf clothes who tased me were the other three members of U.S. Congress. Of course, one was dead and the other half man, half starfish. Before setting fire to the foyer, we raided the pill cabinets. We divided the lithium among ourselves, and the irony isn't lost on me that I've ended up on a prescription med after all. I left for Bermuda in a boat owned by DePaulo, a group of six of us, Asgar among them. A woman survivor turned out to be a captain, and she had nautical discipline. I never saw the other victims after that, but I assume they stayed on St. Helena's. Presently, I'm trying to make my way back to the States, then westward, beginning with some bubble-blowing interlopers. I know that's exactly what they are now. I've got to kill them first. Maybe I'll make them each transform into crabs or starfish or whatever else they might be. And I have a hunch that my old neighbor might have been a tick. I have a lot of killing to do yet. I'm sure there's an Interpol out on me, and whether my targets are pushing their insides out through their mouths, or whether they are crustacean imposters, also blowing bubbles with chewing gum to help provide cover, I'm going to find them out. I'm smarter than they ever thought. Thanks for listening. For those of you who haven't drifted off to dreamland yet, feel free to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at scary to sleep. Come discuss this week's episode with us on Facebook, facebook.com slash scare you to sleep. Check out the Teespring store for some cute new merch. I'm so excited for my new shirt to arrive. I will post pics as soon as it gets here. And this week I'll be posting a Patreon exclusive ASMR episode where I will be reading you a story or two only in a whispered voice for maximum sleepy scares. So head over to my Patreon. I think that's all. Now, go get some sleep. Sweet dreams.